I'm Andrew Hill, the FT's Management Editor. As a long-time observer of chief executives, I've always been interested in how leaders behave under pressure. Whether they're rescuing a company, bidding for another or being bid for, launching a new venture, or even facing disgrace, trial and jail. To run an organisation, you need somehow to be able to cope with intense stress. I went to interview four corporate leaders about how they managed, personally and professionally, in the toughest times. It was a defeat that in some respects was, was merciful, but at the time, yeah, it, it didn't feel great. I take things non-emotionally and I'm more analytical than emotional. It's about as Kafkaesque as you can get. It's like a terrorist sitting there with a gun to your head. Entrepreneurs know the burden of expectation better than any hired executive. The pressure of high hopes, their own and those of their investors, and fast growth. I remember flashing a photo of a, of a ship and I said, the ship is in a hurricane, guys. This is where we're going right now. These are the challenges faced by Marcella Sapone, chief executive and co-founder of Hello Alfred, who wants to bring the luxury of butler services to the masses. We have one shot, and if you're on a wave and you have momentum, there's this feeling like I'm going to lose my shot. I'm an American, uh, but I grew up in Copenhagen and Paris, which meant that I kind of had three very distinct childhoods. And the stress of having to kind of recreate your life and have these brand new experiences and completely different worldviews was kind of the beginning of a place where I learned to kind of deal with pressure. Marcella Sapone founded New York-based online concierge company Hello Alfred with friend Jessica Beck in 2013. The FT caught up with her at the Founders Forum conference near London to talk about the special strain of setting up Hello Alfred. The company links time-poor customers via its app to helpers called Alfreds, after Batman's butler, who clean, shop and run errands. Part of the pressure of running a startup is self-imposed, she says. My co-founder and I have had every job at the company. We've even been the Alfreds ourselves, kind of serving our customers. Uh, I think the pressure we put on ourselves, though, is, is very powerful because you want to have this thing have legs and take off in the real world. And it, in some ways, you're kind of putting yourself out there. Sapone knows what a full-on job feels like, having worked at consultancy McKinsey and in private equity before studying for an MBA at Harvard, where she and Beck had the idea for Hello Alfred. Her pitch won a TechCrunch prize in 2014. With it came $50,000 and a huge dose of publicity. It felt exhilarating. And then you you have to do it every day. And so that moment of sharing and launching is in many founders' life a, like a very memorable moment. Um, the day after, though, it is a difficult one. And so what did you do exactly the day after that you can recall? Well, I can remember actually, so I was in the hotel room with um, Jess and our first... Um, Jess is your co-founder. Jess is my co-founder and my first employee, Christian. And we were all sitting in, in, in bed together with our phones and our computers and the amount of people that were tweeting at us or sending us Facebook messages or emailing us, giving us feedback, asking us questions, like this moment when the whole world feels focused on you, like very much that 15 minutes of fame feeling and an overwhelming kind of feeling like, oh wow, we actually have to go do this now. And so that moment of self-induced pressure that, that the perception is that you are on a path to greatness and that you have to keep it up. And so founders often talk about being on a wave, this moment when you get momentum and to stay on that wave as long as possible and to never ever fall off. There was a downside as critics started to snipe at the idea. One commentator called it frivolous and asinine. I would say that when we launched our company, we actually had a very strong backlash. People said, backlash from Backlash from the press, um, from the media really actually, right. who said, okay, so this is Uber for slaves. Right. Or Uber for servants. Well, how did it feel, that initial burst of backlash, as you called it? How do you think you would feel if you had a child and everyone said to you, wow, your baby's really ugly, repetitively? <laughs> Would you start to believe that's true? Or would you look at, it, at your child and think, you know, this is the most incredible thing that's ever happened? And so it's how do you maintain your own conviction about what you're building? 
and take other people's information and reactions into consideration because you probably are doing something wrong. In our case, we, we weren't doing a good job of explaining what we were doing and why we were doing it. By April 2015, Hello Alfred had secured more than $10 million of funding. Sapone was aware that outside investment could accelerate growth, possibly leading to an initial public offering, with some of the best-known companies in the world as inspiration. We have a very limited amount of resources, and in that, with those resources, we have to build what we think is a very large business. And that when you take venture money, what you're saying is we are going to grow something very, very large. And in, in the venture world, growing quickly has become kind of a race, right? So Amazon IPO'd in three years. Uber, it took them 18 months to really become a kind of prominent force. And so there's this expectation that your growth curve is just a straight line hockey stick. Sapone says she was learning all the time as Hello Alfred expanded its network of gig economy workers, often stay-at-home parents earning extra cash, and took on new clients. She needed to manage pressure on her small team and manage expectations. So we have town hall every week on Friday. The whole team comes together and we talk about the week and we kind of have a celebration. It's kind of our ritual, and I think rituals are very important. But I remember flashing a photo of a, of a ship and I said, the ship is in a hurricane, guys. It showed a very stormy scene and I said, this is where we're going right now. And the reason why I said that to my team was not because we were losing customers or the product wasn't working. It was just an understanding that we didn't have the resources, we didn't have the right supplies on ship to get where we needed to get next. So the team we had was very small, it was seven people. And we were building an operationally complex logistics business. And it just had this sense of, oh, I'm not going to be able to fix this in a week. This is going to take some time. So preparing my team to kind of understand that we were hitting a difficult patch and that that was normal. Have you, have you and Jess had a point where you thought to yourselves, you know what, I just think we can't do this, we shouldn't do this? Or... I mean, to be honest with you, we probably have conversations like that very regularly. And it comes back to that doubt and the stress of wanting to prove something to yourself consistently because at the end of the day the business is going to fail or succeed in some degree based off of your leadership and where you take it and your vision and the path there. Trust is the foundation of Hello Alfred's future success. Busy customers give the keys to their homes to the company's network of butlers. I asked Sapone how she coped with the risk and reality of sometimes letting customers down. What you're looking for is a story where I tell you someone stole something or we lost something or something broke. Of course that happens. It happens every day. It happens in all our own lives. Have you ever gone to the dry cleaner and they said, you know what, there's been an ink stain on I've had all those experiences right? that you mentioned. Okay, so then I'll compound that by thousands. That's the stress we're feeling. That's the stress that we're feeling from our, our customers. But the point is, if you figure out a way to make your employees really care, genuinely care about the customer, and if you communicate with the customer in a way that you are explaining what happened, you're taking care of the problem, then you, you keep that trust. To reinforce the network, Hello Alfred chose to make the Alfreds direct employees, in contrast to the much looser relationship workers have with companies like Uber. Alfreds are put through stringent background checks and extensive training. The model is good for trust overall, but it is also expensive. What it meant is that we were actually constraining our, our ability to um, service the demand. Right. So because was there an argument internally about, about that? Yeah, right. So leaving 30,000 people on a wait list because we couldn't hire quick enough, because we couldn't train. Um, and because we were going to pay a higher wage to really get the economics to work. If we're going to pay an employee a very fair wage, in our case, $16 to $30, how do, you, how do you get that to work and then also have this available at a very accessible price point, so $130 a month? Was it a long discussion to, to reach that point? Yes. It, and it was a I discussion mean, you weren't, I mean, you, you have the title CEO. Yeah. Did you eventually, you personally have to take that decision? You know, I can't remember. 
I don't remember a lot of moments in time where um, something has come to a pinpoint my decision because it really is a conversation that you're having with a lot of smart people that you've gathered around and you're trying to build something together. She's still dealing with the tensions of managing a fast-growing startup where fewer decisions can be delegated and internal conflict sometimes erupts over the company's vision and direction. I mean, I'm dealing with conflict right now. I um, brought my whole team together last Wednesday and I said, guys, this isn't going to work unless we're all here trusting and believing and being transparent with each other. How did you decide between you and Jess who was CEO and who was COO? I think the answer is that's the way we, op we operate. We're a very good team and we complement each other very well. She is a consistent operator that comes in every day and, and is able to improve things. And I'm more of the person that starts the idea and puts the design constraints and comes in and kind of edits to make it better. We just kind of complement each other. But CEO is not, a, is not a title. It's something that you earn. It's, it's something you earn from having good ideas most of the time. As Sapone told me, it's normal for her to work a 90-hour non-stop week. Her prior experience in business helps relieve the tension, but so do a few personal techniques. When, when things are crashing all together and things are going wrong, so we just lost a contract. We got an upset email from one of our investors. We've had some very important customers tweet uh, online about a, a service that, that has, wasn't good. Um, we've lost keys. I mean, everything happens you, under the sun that you can imagine all at the same time. You'll sneak out at that point? Not at that point. What you do is you have to be very centered. You just deal with whatever it is, point by point, and, in, and look for the controllable things. For me personally, after a moment where I've, you've expended a lot of energy kind of really thinking through and trying to make those good decisions and calling on all the things you've ever learned at any point in time, is taking the time to step back and go to a soul cycle or take 90 minutes and do some Bikram yoga in 115 degree because it just clears out your head and allows you to kind of recharge. Sapone's intense focus on the future of Hello Alfred and its position in the race against other startups competing for customers and cash is evident. As a founder, she has already tasted success, but there is a long way still to go and a lot of pressure still to soak up. It's not a very heroic thing to be a founder. It's not like this beautiful, crazy story that's just, you know, I had an idea and, and now it's a billion dollar company. It's a gritty, consistent, showing up for the race, every single day. You think and you think and you kind of have this mental model like okay I know I'm running a marathon. I know this isn't a sprint. I know this is going to take me two or three years to figure it out. But what you really viscerally don't understand until you've kind of gone down the path of building is that you're in an ultra marathon and you don't know when it's going to stop. What if you're on this marathon for the rest of your life? I mean think about Mark Zuckerberg and Warren Buffett. I feel like we all have one shot. We have one shot and if you're on a wave and you have momentum, there's this feeling like I'm gonna lose my shot. Fear of missing out. The fear of what could have been. Regret.